All right, so hello everybody, good morning, welcome to the Time of Your Life Celebration 2022 jointly organised by the National Library Board and the Singapore University of Social Sciences. My name is Lester Liu, very happy to be the MC today. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. So the title of today's webinar, Banking for the Evolving Community. So in today's session, you will find out how banks are enhancing their services to support the diverse needs of the community. We'll first begin with a sharing by Mr. Bob Ng. He's the Senior Vice President, Head of Consumer, pardon me, Head of Personal and Premier Banking Onshore, Consumer Financial Services Singapore at OCBC Bank. Followed by a sharing from Ms. Yo Wenxian, Head of POSB and Head of Retail Customer Segment, Consumer Banking Group Singapore at DBS Bank. And after which there will be a Q&A session and it will be moderated by Ms. Lin Su Fei, Deputy Director at the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre. Now, after the, uh, during the Q&A, you can submit any questions that you want to our panel as well. In fact, you can do it right now or at any point in time when they are sharing. So just click on the Q&A icon either on the top or the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. So after the Q&A session, we will have Ying Yi. She's an associate librarian with NLB. She'll be sharing with us some of the useful NLB resources. And lastly, I will be sharing with all of you a bit more about SUSS's gerontology program. So most importantly, we hope that this online webinar will help us celebrate the time of your lives by diving into facets of aging like gerontology and also lifelong learning as well as your physical and mental well-being as well. So without further ado, for our first presentation today, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Bob Ng. He heads the Personal Banking and Premier Banking Onshore at OCBC with over 20 years of experience in the banking industry. He joined OCBC in 2004 as a senior officer before moving to head the bank's Chengdu branch from 2010 to 2014. He continued to drive service excellence and business growth in Singapore through various projects and efforts. He has a diverse retail banking experience and his mission is to strengthen client experience in this hyper-digitalized post-pandemic world. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready, please join me to welcome Mr. Bob Ng. Welcome, Bob. Morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Bob. Um, Today, my sharing uh, will be more on transforming the banking experience for the active aging. Okay, next, um, I will jump into my presentations. Okay, next, um, first, I, we will, I will have some data to share with everyone on the aging population and which is an increasing trend in Singapore. Um, this data, um, not from the bank, but from, I extracted from Streets Time recently. Right? As you can see, right, um, we, Singapore's population um, is aging rapidly. One in five citizens are 65 years and above from, um, as of now, it's about 18%. And when we move into 2030, right, it's expected to be about 24%, meaning um, one in four, four of our uh, population here is elderly customers. And how does this translate to our customers that visit the branch today? Right Next, you can see that at OCBC branches, we do observe right, the same trend at our branches. And in fact, one in every three branch customers are aged 60 and above. And this is also partly due to a mega trend in digitalization, right? Where 90% of the transactions are done digitally today, be it through your, our mobile banking, our internet banking, or our ATMs, right? So how do we help our customers? Um, to help our elderly customers hop onto this digital trend, um, we have started a journey last year by conducting an in-branch engagement class. Um, so far, we have conducted um, 14 of such classes covering about 150 customers. And we have some interesting insights. And from there on, right, then that's how we know what does our elderly customers need. And you, you can see that the first, their most common banking needs are relatively basic. Right? They don't need complex transactions. It's more towards how does customers um, change their transaction limits, um, deposit coins, um, check transactions or statements, online transfer, or even activating dormant accounts. And we, we, we don't blatantly push customers to digital as uh, we want to understand more of their challenge as well. Right? So um, the few key challenge that we found out from customers is that it's, it's more towards a lack of knowledge on how to toggle around the digital app today, how to even toggle around the ATMs. And also, why are they not moving on to a mobile banking app or mobile banking or internet banking? 
um, a lot of them is really fearing of making mistakes. And last but not least, they are also fear of falling to prey to scams, right? And um, from this class itself, we, we have seen a very, uh, a very good adoption rate after this class. 75% of our customers, uh, after our lessons, right, they actually started using digital service, right? Uh, and of course, now, nowadays, they are banking more towards the digital service than queuing up, um, facing the two or three hours of queue sometimes as long as that in the branches already. Right, next, we, and from there, right, uh, I want to share a bit more on our OCBC elderly engagement model. Right, next. Okay, hover around these three key things, okay, that, that we really embrace on. Um, the hardware, the hardware, and the data insights. How do we use data to help us? Right, the hardware will be on. How do we experimental learning through the impact sharing sessions? Right, and proactively, how do you proactively engage, empathize, and also assist customers? The hardware, we also how to ensure right, the ease of branch entry and queue, especially for our elderly customers, and intuitive visual supports. Later, I will have some examples to share. And the other will be on the data insights. How does you use data right, in today's world to help our customers as well? The hardware, right? Um, this program that I mentioned just now, the purpose of our elderly engagement class, right, is to teach our senior citizens, right, on how to use digital banking and avoid scam and heartland branches. So we bring, so this is a, a, a highly customized um, engagement class, right? We, we don't do it through um, um, WebEx, we don't do it through Teams, we don't do it through Zoom, right? We actually bring customer back to the branches. Right, and have a dedicated staff to every customer right, to attend to them. And it's a one-on-one -on -one format covering everyday digital banking and payment skills. So we also walk through with them step-by-step -step on um, how to use our digital OCBC digital app and also how to make QR code payments and even how to use QR code to withdraw money from our ATM without even having to bring an ATM card. And we also share with them on doing pay now transfers. Right? And we also emphasize on cybersecurity so that um to so that these elderly customers can really enjoy the convenience of our banking without falling um falling prey to phishing scams and other scams that leverage on digital channels. Right? Like I mentioned, uh, we are targeting to upskill more than 400 elderly customers across 25 workshops by Q2 2023. And these workshops are conducted at all our branches. It's not, for, it's not just concentrated on one or two branches, right? Next, um, these are some of, we, we really have very encouraging starts, right? And uh, these are some of the verbal teams shared with us by our customers. So they feel more comfortable with this one-to-one -one guidance um, from the staff. And uh, you, you'll be interested on the ground that they really wanted to learn more. They really wanted to learn more. And some even state more than, more than, more than our program timing. Right? And just to, just to ask us to share with them more on how to do certain, certain other features. And customers are very satisfied and to learn all this and most important thing and how to protect themselves from scams. And during the class, right, I still remember um, all the customers is very active in sharing their own experience on how to use the digital apps, even teaching people that they don't know in the class, and also, um, also on their recent so-called um, scam experience and how to avoid it and prevent it. Okay. Um, next, I have a video to share with everyone, a short clip and just uh, to sh give you a better idea on how this uh, class is conducted in the branch. Video, please. For elderly customers who are not confident to transact digitally, but are eager to learn, we find ways to build their confidence in embracing digital. We invite them to these OCBC Digital Silver Workshops to educate them on digital literacy and awareness on scam prevention. The feedback has been positive. In the past sessions, customers learn in a conducive environment with our staff 
guiding and demonstrating how to use the digital features and clarify their doubts within their comfort zone. These workshops are conducted on one-on-one -on -one format at our Heartland branches since May this year to provide undivided attention to every elderly customer, customised to their needs. Each customer's assigned branch staff will be able to converse in the language or even the dialect of customer's choice. Okay, um, next. Yeah, we'll be on the hardware issue, right? And how do we strengthen our day-to-day -day engagement with our daily customers, right? And for our staff, our digital ambassador at the branches, right? We do have a day-to-day -day guide for them. And this one is, we are refreshing it every day, right? On This is so, so to enable them to sharpen their understanding and response to customers' verbal, visual, and vocal cues. And we will, we will also ensure that the staff, right, they are able to speak customers' language of choice. So all our staff um, are able to converse in some dialects uh, to ease the communication with our elderly customers in the branch. And we also render close assistance, right, to customers with dementia. Staff are being trained to look out for signs of cognitive impairment impacting customers' decision-making, right? By probing a lot more questions, looking at their behaviors, right? Sometimes when we know the staff, we will also call their family members down as well, right? To assist in customers' day-to-day -day transactions. For the hardware, next. How do we ease branch entry and queue, right? And also some intuitive visual support to, end, to help them in their day-to-day -day banking. Priority seats, right? Um, we are seats given to elderly, disabled, and pregnant women. So these chairs, right? Uh, as you know, sometimes you go into the branch, it may be a stool without any hand support. So all our branches are equipped with chairs with hand support. So for ease of customers getting up. And we also issue priority queues, tickets to our elderly customers so that our elderly customers can finish the transactions faster. Right? And interesting. This is one interesting thing that we did for ATM cards, right? We even, we even have visual cues to customer that can orientate how to use their card more easily. If you can see the picture, right, there's an arrow to show customer how to, where to insert the card into the ATM, right? And some branches where, at like example, shop houses, branches, right? Um, we have a portable ramp, right, to graduate the entrance to customers for mobile, with mobility issues. Last, lastly, right, um, data analytics. This is um, a very powerful feedback tools, uh, feedback loop that we have used day to day, right, to help us to how to continue to build and refine our engagement with our elderly customers, right? Um, customers transactions over the counters, right? Um, we from there, right, we are able to get the quantitative insights, like the demographics of customers and the common type of transactions that they do in the branches. Then not only on the quantitative side, we also cast based on customer feedback and the staff feedback, right? And then this will give us more qualitative insights, right? And with the quantitative and quality insights here, this, these are the data analytics that we use to help us um, build our elderly engagement initiatives and continue to build and refine and continue to conduct classes, cater the needs of our elderly customers. Okay, um, that's all for my presentations. Uh, I'll later, if you have any questions, please feel free um, to, to, to ask the questions here and I will answer it during the Q&A sessions. All right, so a big thank you to Mr. Bob Ng for your presentation. Well, I saw a lot of uh, questions uh, in the chat as well, so I'm, I'm looking at it now. Uh, so thank you very much for your questions. Uh, so do keep, keep the questions coming in, and uh, Mr. Bob can choose to pick up 
on the questions during the Q&A later on. Uh, also, uh, for our friends, if you don't have any questions, it's okay. You can also go into the Q&A function. Uh, you can like the questions that you want answered. And our moderator later on can choose to uh, pick up on those questions later on. So thank you very much, Mr. Bob Ng, for the very informative sharing on uh, some of the uh, things that OCBC is currently doing. Now, we're now here from Ms. Yo Wen Xian. Now, she's the head of POSB and head of retail customer segment with the Consumer Banking Group Singapore in DBS. She drives cognitive banking capabilities in the retail customer segment and strives to strengthen the financial planning customer value proposition at DBS and POSB. She works with community partners to expand POSB's outreach through engagement programs and is committed to bringing value to all segments of the population, including youths, seniors, migrant workers, and persons with special needs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Ms. Yo Wen Xian. Hello, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, thanks for giving me time today to talk about how at POSB and at DBS, we are continuing to help uh, the community bank uh, whilst the, con the community continues to evolve in terms of their behavior and their needs. So uh, next slide, please. Um, many of you are familiar with the POSB brand and POSB as a bank. Um, we're no strangers. POSB is uh, actually more than 150 years old in terms of the brand. Um, we have a very, very strong sense of purpose. Uh, our tagline, our motto is neighbors first, bankers second. Um, and we recognize that we have a very important role to play in society as the people's bank. Um, similarly, DBS, actually, when we were founded, we were known as the Development Bank of Singapore. Our uh, aspiration uh, as the society's needs continue to transform is, uh, we joke that DBS also stands for uh, Digital Bank of Singapore. I think that's our aspiration as well. Um, and I've also heard, because of our tagline, live more bank less, we also want to be a disappearing bank. We want to embed our services seamlessly into the lives and the everyday experiences of our customers. So, but more importantly, I think even as we evolve, as we continue to build out our digital banking services, our journeys to support the community, uh, we are also very cognizant that we need to continue to stay inclusive, whether it's at our DBS POSB touch points uh, to ensure that there are segments in our communities that do not get left behind. So um, I'm here to also share about what are we doing similar to what Bob had shared uh, earlier. I think across Singapore, all the banks have a very same philosophy and approach in terms of wanting to continue to be inclusive um, whilst catering to the diverse needs of our community. Uh, by the way, actually, um, I also wanna point out since we have this slide here, uh, the lady in the POSB t-shirt, uh, her name is Florence. She's one of our digital ambassadors. So uh, whilst we support customers who are seniors, we also try to play an active part in helping seniors to age uh, actively in society. We have about 40 seniors who work with us in our front line, either part-time, full-time, and they have a very, very strong sense of purpose. So they themselves are quite digital. And they also think that they can play a part in helping uh, fellow seniors to embrace digital, to get comfortable with digital. And I think because they're so exemplary in role modeling uh, their behaviors, like in, in embracing digital services, they also inspire other seniors and um, are and very encouraging towards other seniors in adopting uh, such digital services. So here, Florence is, uh, what you can see is her patiently explaining using her own device, you know, services that seniors can access um, or, and it could be, you know, uh, digital banking services or even like just showing them what else is available in terms of the digital landscape. Okay, so our next slide, please. Um, we have been transforming our branches. It's nothing new, actually. If you think back to what branches looked like 50 years ago, branches, um, you know, I, I don't have a picture here, but 50 years ago, I think our branches looked like jail cells. Uh, you know, there were like steel bars at the counters. Uh, people were afraid about, you know, robbery, all these things. So over the last 50 years, uh, 
and we have never stopped transforming our branches, right? We transform them based on the evolving behaviors of our society, the evolving needs, you know, as crime became less of a concern, our branches became more open, you're able to kind of interact with branch staff in a much more informal way, uh, you know, no barriers. I think the only barriers we put in place was when we had COVID and we needed the plexiglass screens uh, to protect our customers and also our staff. But essentially we are operating in a barrier-free format today. Similarly, as society has evolved and become more digital and people want to bank in a more convenient way, we have also been transforming our branches to be more digital in nature. Now, what does digital mean? Digital means that we will still continue to have a physical presence, but uh, as with as technology becomes more sophisticated, there's also an opportunity for us to leverage new technologies in our branches to be able to serve our customers more conveniently. And that's important because, um, you know, customers also want to be able to bank 24 seven. They want to be able to bank at their convenience. Um, and so that is also something that we've been looking into in order to respond to how our customers want to bank with us. Uh, but what hasn't changed is that we realize as well that even though customers want to bank uh, digitally uh, through self-service machines, sometimes they also need access to staff to be able to have like a human connection, to have, uh, to be able to ask for help. So uh, on this page here on the right, you see a picture of our video teller machine. If our, if customers uh, need help, uh, they're able to also speak to a uh, frontline uh, staff, uh, ask their questions, get their uh, questions answered and still have a few human connection, but enabled by digital. And actually we have real staff there. So it's not an avatar that they would be talking to. Um, and sometimes we also find that, you know, there might be language challenges as well, uh, literacy challenges. So it's actually, it's good for them to talk to someone to be able to get their questions uh, answered. So as we have evolved the branches, we've continued to also, uh, we put in new machines. We also continue to increase the number of capabilities that we offer through our machines as well. Um, similar to OCBC, we use a lot of data analytics to understand what kind of services do our customers require when they come to branches. And harnessing the power of technology, we are also availing such services uh, through the machines. So for instance, uh, this year, we are adding nine new services to our um, either our ATM branch teller machines or our uh, video teller machines. Um, for example, this month, we're actually rolling out the ability for you to update your signature at the video teller machine. Traditionally, you could only do it at the counter in a branch. But again, we know that that is not how people want to access banking services. They would like to be able to access it, uh, services more conveniently uh, based on their schedule. And so uh, starting this month, you can go to a video teller machine to update your signature. Uh, and then I think that provides greater con convenience to many of our customers. In addition, uh, towards the end of this year in the fourth quarter, we're also going to be rolling out the ability for uh, our passbook customers to be issued a new passbook at our video teller machine. And again, this is a new capability that we're rolling out to, en uh, to enable our customers to bank more conveniently. Um, next slide, please. I think over the last, um, since the start of 2020, uh, especially over the circuit uh, breaker period, we've really seen society go through a significant shift in uh, behavior in terms of adopting digital services. I think COVID catalyzed this change. I think we, uh, we definitely have a government that we can thank for, you know, having put in place a smart nation roadmap, which came in very, very handy during the COVID period. So for instance, uh, what we've seen with the impact of COVID is it's completely transformed the way we work, the way we play, the way we shop, the way we bank. Uh, for our customers, we've seen a behavioral shift, uh, the willingness to adopt 
uh, digital banking services to be able to self-help through digital services. Uh, a very strong preference as well for contactless payments. Uh, for instance, my mother who's in her 70s, I recall in 2019, when I gave her a QR Hong Pao, a PayLa QR Hong Pao, she said, oh, I don't know how to claim this. I don't have PayLa. So I said, it's okay. Dad has PayLa. He can claim the Hong Pao for you. And actually what surprised me over the COVID period, so my mother who goes to the wet markets, like she also, you know, was afraid of germs, uh, like touching money. So she downloaded PayLa uh, in order for her to scan and pay at the wet market so that she doesn't have to use money uh, when she does her payments. Uh, she also has, uh, so her adoption as well of contactless payments from what I see in our data is that it's not unusual. Many of our senior customers, are, you know, because of COVID, they were open-minded, they embraced uh, new channels. So for instance, uh, compared to pre-COVID, about we have customers who only go to branches for their banking needs. But because of COVID, we saw 43% of our pre-COVID branch only customers uh, migrate to other channels. They tried our ATM machines and continued to use them. They also downloaded our digi banking app, continue to use uh, online banking services. And as a result, amongst this group of customers who are only uh, branch going customers, only one single channel, we have seen actually a 51% drop in their branch visits. Uh, sorry, um, we've seen a drop in their branch visits uh, and also a higher adoption of digital banking services. In addition, what we've done to also support uh, the shift to digital banking because of COVID is we also, uh, similar to uh, OCBC, but we did start this earlier, um, we rolled out uh, digital literacy seminars to better support the community during the COVID period. And as a result, um, we have continued to see a change in behaviors of our customers when they attend these seminars. For instance, uh, tracking the data uh, of such participants, we've seen a 51% drop in their branch visits and also a 10% increase in their digital banking transactions. Um, maybe you will go over to the next slide, please, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what we are doing in the digital literacy space. Um, so in terms of uh, supporting the seniors in our community, we realize that it is very important for us to be on the ground to support them. They may have the aspiration, the desire, the curiosity to change, uh, to adopt, but sometimes they may not be, uh, they may not get the support at home. For instance, you know, their kids are busy. Uh, sometimes also uh, when our seniors come to our branches, they also say, you know, they try to learn at home, but sometimes it's not so easy for them to learn on their own. Uh, Sometimes also the grandkids may not be so patient in teaching them and be like, Amma, how come you cannot remember? So they come to our branches and, um, our and our customers are quite gratified that our service staff are very patient and are willing to um, keep teaching them in a repeated manner to reinforce the learnings. So for instance, um, you know, we have a few uh, employee initiatives we have our people of purpose programs, our employees uh, across the bank, not just our branch staff, uh, will volunteer for to lead digital literacy workshops. Uh, we partner with IMDA. So if you go onto the IMDA website, you can look up the learning journeys uh, for e-payment journeys, for instance, learning journeys, sign up for those. Uh, we also partner with uh, PA. We, uh, if you drop by our branches and inquire, uh, we also run uh, literacy workshops in our branches. So in one of the pictures, on the, um, the first picture on the left, you see that we have customers in our branches being taught by our staff how to use uh, digital banking on their mobile, how to use PayLa. Uh, we also have learning journeys where we realize, uh, again, it may not be so easy for seniors to teach themselves to self-help. And so hence, we also have learning journeys in our branches to teach seniors how to use self-service banking machines, such as the ATMs, the branch teller machines, or the video teller machines. 
so that they're able to look up their balance, they can perform their balance inquiries, they're able to withdraw cash, uh, change their, uh, replace their cards if they are to lose it, or to also how to you know, change their PIN, etc. I think all these workshops are, are very important uh, because even uh, what we do from time to time is to also update the content because technology is changing, the needs of our society are changing, even um, what we're facing with scams, the scams themselves, uh, the scamsters are also very evolving very, very fast. So at our workshops as well, we cover a whole range of topics, um, how to use online banking, how to also be vigilant about scam, what are the different scenarios that we see in the market. Uh, but more importantly, because the scam scenarios are evolving so fast, you know, what should they be detecting? How can they be better aware that this could be a scam scenario, even if we haven't previously covered it in a workshop? Uh, so all these are the things that we're doing to help our seniors continue to, you know, upskill themselves, to stay vigilant, uh, to protect themselves, and to help them continue to bank conveniently um, in, a, in the digital age. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as our society continues to uh, age, right, I think, and Bob had shared the Singapore data, uh, we realized that it was also very important uh, for us to upskill and be better aware about dementia. And dementia is a, is a very, very wide range, like, because it's a whole spectrum. It's not so easy for us to detect whether or not a customer has dementia. And sometimes in our experiences, we also realize that customers themselves might also be shy about the fact that they have dementia and they might try to cloak that they have dementia. Mm -hmm. So the first thing was we realized that dementia is incredibly complex and there was a need for us to upskill our staff uh, so that uh, they're more aware about dementia, they're better trained in detecting the signs of dementia and how do they go about empathetically communicating with our customers who might have dementia, uh, who might be anxious about their dementia, or who might be embarrassed about their dementia? So um, what we rolled out is uh, at DBS, we require, we rolled out mandatory training for all staff uh, for dementia awareness. So it's not just our branch staff who are trained. But when we first rolled it out, we focused on branch staff. And within the first month, 90% uh, of our branch staff uh, were trained on dementia awareness. Um, when, we, when our staff encounter dementia customers, I think the first thing is to, uh, again, through uh, rapport building, questioning, identify, for instance, are they cognizant of the transactions they're wanting to perform? Um, are they, for instance, could they be misled by somebody? Is there a mix of kin? Uh, so we usually would probe them, encourage them. Is there a mix of kin that, um, you know, especially if the value of the transaction is quite large and the type of transaction that they're trying to perform is highly unusual compared to their historical behavior, we will encourage them to call, contact their next of kin. And sometimes these conversations can take quite long because they may not recognize that, um, you know, that it could be a scam. So usually what we would do is, um, if it happens in the branch, we would ask the customer to go to a private room, a customer face uh, a room in our branch where there is uh, more privacy for us to have these conversations with the customer, you know, keep probing them and then uh, use the time to also encourage them to reach out to a mix of kin, uh, like a close relative who would be able to better advise them. And it's not unusual as well when we reach out to the mix of kin, uh, that actually um, we also seen situations that the relative would also come down to the branch, uh, you know, to assist their relative. So these are a few of the things that we're doing on the dementia front, but it continues to be uh, evolving uh, and, you know, we will we'll continue to work with the community partners, such as the Agency for Integrated Care, in order to continue to upgrade our awareness and our skill sets uh, when it comes to dementia awareness. Um, okay, and I think that 
is it from me. So uh, maybe Lester, over back to you. Great. So thank you very much, Wenxian, for the wonderful sharing. My first bank account is a POSB account. I mean, uh, as with my generation. So uh, I believe all of us are very familiar with both POSB and OCBC. Uh, earlier on, Mr. Bob Wong touched on some of the programs as well. So a big thank you to both our speakers. So time check now is 10.40. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do a 10 minutes break and we will resume the Q&A segment at 10.50, 10.50. All right, so in the meantime, please go and enjoy your break. Uh, when we come back, uh, our moderator will choose to uh, answer those questions or ask our speakers to answer those questions. So I see a lot of good questions uh, within the Q&A chat box already. Uh, so do remember, you can also like the questions that you want answered as well. All right, so with that, have a good break. I will see you back here at 10.50 a.m. in 10 minutes. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, hello everybody, welcome back. Uh, so we are going to forward with our Q&A session and we're going to have a great discussion because looking at through some of the questions uh, that all of you have posted, uh, we're going to have a fantastic session uh, where our experienced bankers will be answering those questions. So I'd like to invite Mr. Bob Ng and Ms. Yeo Wen Xian uh, back to join us. Uh, this session will be moderated by Ms. Lin Su Fei. She's the Deputy Director for the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre or NVPC. So a little bit more about Su Fei. Well, she works with different stakeholders at NVPC to drive and implement national level interventions to reshape the corporate agenda. As a strong believer in the potential of businesses as a force for good, her work strives to encourage businesses to contribute to a better society. So this comes after having spent more than a decade in government, where she worked with businesses and industry partners in aviation and food manufacturing industries, as well as in Latin America. Sufei is also an executive committee member of the Enterprise Singapore Society and volunteers with community non-profit organizations in Singapore. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speakers and I'd like to hand the time over to our moderator, Ms. Lin Sufei. Sufei, over to you. Thank you, Lester. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I hope you had a very informative session uh, with the speakers sharing earlier. Uh, so I see the questions coming in fast and furious. Um, Bob, I'm going to direct, I think, a couple of the, the first questions to you. Uh, so, I mean, firstly, kudos to OCBC, you know, for launching the OCBC Digital Silvers Program. And I think likewise with BABS and POSB that's been conducting digital literacy workshops, particularly focused on the seniors. Um, but I guess to OCBC, you know, what type of clients are entitled to these programs, these workshops you've been conducting? Uh, when, when can seniors attend these digital silver sessions at OCBC? And I'll pass it over to Wenxian later on, yeah. just to kick things off. Thanks, Bob. Oh, um, your, your question is when can customers attend? Yeah, is there a like, schedule that people can We have a schedule to... at the branches, yes. Um, they can actually walk to any our, of our branches to register the, um, their interests. And our branch staff will be able to share the schedule with them. So every, every month we have certain branches that uh, we will rotate branches to conduct such um, such sessions and uh, we will share the schedule with them and then uh, they can they can sign up at any branches and then we will inform them uh, when uh, of their of I mean we will inform them when the when the time comes and then to to check on their availability. Are these like one-off workshops? No, or... no, this this is not one off workshop. So we are conducting numerous classes every month. It's a continuous. So we, we, we know that we, um, we have a large base to cover, right? To me, it's just like a marathon. You will never have to, you, you cannot stop doing that. So we are committed to just continue doing this for the long term. And uh, typically, um, how often does say, let's say a senior customer, when they attend such workshops, are mm. they comfortable then to use the digital services independently? Oh, yes. Um, like I said, we, we don't, we don't um, really push everything, all the digital stuff in, the, in, in, the, in our mobile app to customer to say that, oh, look, this is so, so many digital, I mean, so many digital, digital things that you have to learn and use day to day. We, we are very targeted on those that can serve their needs. Right. And so, for example, if let's say um, they, we will help them hook on to the digital app, help them sign up mobile banking, and then very basic functions like check their uh, deposit balance. Right. That's one key thing. And second key thing is hey, how can you use, you don't even have to bring an ATM card today, right? With our digital app, go to OCBC um, ATM, and how can you use the QR code at the OCBC ATM to just withdraw money? Right. So these are the two key things that usually customers will look for. Checking account balance and also how to withdraw money using the digital app. 
And then, uh, like I said, we will also share with them um, uh, ATM, ATM services that is of um, more, more frequent for them to, to do things, right? And uh, like you, you, just now you saw that um, ATM card, right? We also put the arrow so that uh, the, at least the old people will say, okay, this is the way how I should insert the card. These are some visual aids. So um, not very complex digital transaction with customers. So the, 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 the LDD customer actually welcome it. They really welcome it. Uh, once again, how about at DBS? Yeah, at DBS, uh, we believe that it's very important to partner uh, uh, other agencies such as like IMDA, PA for us to amplify our reach. Um, so for instance, actually, if you go onto the IMDA website uh, and look up their e-payment learning journeys, actually all that is supported by also uh, together with us. So we have our staff who are also there uh, running these seminars. We do a, a combination actually. So we do them in person. We also do them, uh, you know, uh, virtually as well. So since, um, so we've done, I think we've, over the years, we've had more than 120 face-to-face uh, -face and virtual e-payment workshops in partnership with IMDA and People's Association, just to name a couple, uh, engaging about 5,700 seniors uh, in Singapore. So if you want to find out more, I encourage you to go to the IMDA uh, website or you can Google it, IMDA Learning Journeys, and then you can see the schedule there. So they have classes across uh, Singapore in the various districts, you know, Central, North, uh, East and West. In addition, you can also uh, go to our, any of our branches to also inquire or like to express interest in, uh, you know, in one of our branch health uh, workshops. And then the branch staff will also contact you to let you know when would the next workshop be held. So for us primarily, I think you know, it's important to work with different community partners to reinforce the need uh, to also work with community partners to get the feedback as to how we should continue to tailor and evolve our learning journeys. So that is the, the approach that we've also taken. Thanks, Wansian. Um, There's a question about how maybe the banking apps um, can help seniors who are actually visually impaired, uh, maybe possibly due to, you know, eye diseases that, may, that they may have in older age, uh, to transact using a mobile app or phone bank. So that's directed to the both of you, yeah. Maybe I'll take that first. I, I have to acknowledge we're not very good at this in terms of uh, catering to the needs of the visually impaired. What we've done so far is um, we've made, we've availed, we've provided for some years now, uh, we have talking ATMs. So there are uh, talking ATMs. So not all our ATMs are able to talk, uh, but we have, um, talking ATMs scattered across the island. So if you're visually impaired, then it's probably good um, to maybe have a family member help you uh, identify where is the closest talking ATM to you. Uh, so our talking ATMs are designed for people who are visually impaired uh, because um, it uses speech. There's also Braille on uh, these talking ATMs as well. Uh, to better guide uh, the visually impaired. But I have to acknowledge that today, if you are truly, let's say you are visually impaired um, and sight is a problem because our apps don't speak, you know, that is probably the biggest hindrance. Uh, however, I, uh, what you can do is, uh, you know, contact our uh, customers uh, center, our call center to get the support that you need. And then also, you know, our branches, we have branch staff uh, on site uh, who would also be able to guide the customers. Thanks, Wenxian. How about uh, Bob at OCBC? Uh, um, like what Wenxian has said, uh, we, we are not really doing a good job here for this visually impaired. Um, that's where the branches will play a very important role for visually impaired customers, right? And um, and uh, we don't have a teller te telling AT talking ATM machines in OCBC, right? So we will, we will have to rely on our branches and our trained digital ambassadors 
in, in the branch to help service our visually impaired customers and also our, our call centers or contact centers, the 24 hours contact centers to assist our customers as well. Right, so I guess this is a segment yes, uh, yes. the banks will continue have, to work on. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a question about, you know, are there plans to also do outreach to say uh, suitable homebound seniors, uh, potentially working with community partners, right, to identify and refer suitable seniors who are keen and able to learn to make banking transactions online? Is, is that already being done to some extent? Yeah. Um, so I think let's say when it comes to the learning journeys, like I said earlier, they are we have a mix of physical and virtual. Again, I think one of the the real one of the reasons why we pivoted to virtual is also because of COVID. Not everyone wants to go out, and we found that um, so initially uh, some of the seniors also didn't know how to get onto like the virtual uh, seminars. So Zoom did not come easy for them to pick up as well. Um, and actually in our work, our people of purpose uh, partnership with organizations such as Lion Befrienders, actually Lions was very good. Um, you know, they, they set up, uh, they had like uh, laptops or computers set up in their centers. And then through that, you know, so the first thing was to uh, get the seniors in, show them what Zoom is about, how do you use it? And it was quite cute. So we did some of our volunteering efforts uh, with Lions in order to just continue to engage, uh, make sure that the seniors continue to have social interactions, but because of safe distancing, we couldn't meet in person. But it was a great way of getting the seniors onboarded onto Zoom. So the first thing was uh, at the centers, they showed the seniors how to do it. And the seniors were quite curious. They're like, where are you? You know, you know, because it was like some of profile, some of them, it was like their first Zoom talk, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm actually at home. I'll show them like where I'm staying, you know, like what my bedroom looks like, because you know, take away my filter, all these things. So they were also, it was very humorous. The first few seniors I interacted with, um, uh, you know, because they were like, it was such a strange yet enlightening experience to them. And so anyway, uh, because of the efforts by all these, you know, volunteer organizations, by IMDA, by the various agencies, we've seen even a pickup in terms of uh, like webinar adoptions amongst the seniors. So we also continue till today to run a mix of virtual uh, webinars for those who are, you know, literacy sessions, for those who want to be able to continue to learn from home. Um, and then for those who want actually in-person social interaction, because I think that's also important for the seniors. They want to be able to, and that's why seniors also come to the branch. It's not because they can't bank digitally. Sometimes they also enjoy the conversations that we have, they have with our staff in our branches as well. So we also continue to avail in-person uh, literacy seminars too. Thanks, Wen Bob, anything yep. to share? Yeah. Uh, just to add on, um, we also reach out to IMDA to uh, Singapore Digital Office to collaborate on our education of our customers on upskilling their digital literacy. So some of our workshop actually that we conduct in branch, we are also supported by the digital ambassadors. And we uh, we are constantly, I mean, continue to engage and educating our elderly customers in such digital literacy workshops at our heartland areas. And we, we tried webinars before, right? And <laughs> but the result is not as effective that, uh, or I mean, it's, the result is not as effective as what we wanted. So uh, that's why we, we make a decision. Let's say we, we don't want to go with the scale of customers, right? Let's bring customer back to the branch. Every session we make, you don't make it too big, 20, 30 people max, right? And so that we are able to cater to them one-to-one -one and give them all the attention that they want to help them to onboard into this um, digital transformation. Uh, so, and even at the branches, right, we will also have our, I mean, our iPads ready, our, our laptops ready, right, we will, we will, we will even share with them, right, next time, let's say, we have anything on the webinar, this is what you should be doing, and uh, I think the personalizations uh, and the customized or one-to-one -one engagement with customers uh, will bring up more uh, learnings on our elderly customers, yeah. Yeah, and noted that uh, the approach is to kind of feature real life stories, right? Yes. By, yes. Yeah, maybe almost victims and. Oh, and yeah. Staff. Yeah. Uh, recently, that, that's a very interesting one. So, so we uh, thank, thanks to the victim that really wanted to come down and share her experience on how she's being scammed to 
to to our customers as well. So such a workshops, and uh, when you see that person face to face, articulating those real stories to you, it, it really bring up their attention, right, on what to take note of and what not. And then on 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 the in the branch itself, I also personally went to share some of the experience that I personally have while trying to convince customers of certain scams, and we successfully managed to do it. And it and in 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 the recent in the recent scams incidents, right? You can see that it's not just uh just clicking the phishing scams phishing links. It come in any various for different type of forms and forms and shapes already. In in terms of how scam is being uh, attacking us here, so it is it's a great learning. It's a great learning and great sharing. And you will be surprised, right? The the elderly customer they will start to share their experience. Yeah, I remember I received this. I received that. Don't do this. Remember, ah, you cannot. When you see the number plus six five, don't ever go and pick it up. So th they will start sharing as well. So quite an interesting session. So when you start to do it face face to face, yeah. Thanks, Bob. So I think that's a nice segue into the next um, part of, you know, where a lot of questions are clustering around, which is about how, you know, security fraud and financial exploitation are actually becoming quite of concern, especially to this segment of the population. Uh, seniors are particularly vulnerable. Uh, so some questions have come in. Um, one is about, you know, what are the future measures that banks, I guess, both OCBC and DBS uh, will be taking, let's say, for digital transactions? Um, especially given the, the higher number of incidents last year as well. So I'm not sure OCBC or DBS can go first. Well, um, I can go first. And uh, I mean, it, I, I think it's, it's more towards how do we consistently communicate with our customers. The bank security system is actually intact, right? But it's more towards how does the scam cause some uh, misjudgment on the customers itself and then they are able to exploit that. So banks has been sending out message to customers, um, educating them on the scam prevention tips. And also these tips are also refreshed regularly in our mobile banking app and also on internet banking website. Right. And uh, we also proactively actively right, share tips on how we engage customers. Uh, when we engage customers who work into our branches, we also proactively share the tips Right on on how to how to prevent uh, how to prevent scam, and on top of that, right, uh, I saw some question just now relating right how how can I how if 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 I'm a victim now how can I stop all my transactions at one go because if you call the contact center well, I I may have to wait very long I don't want to talk to machine I want to talk to a human ASAP, um that's why if today for OCBC contact um contact center right if you call a customer service hotline. You just need to press a eight, right? It will, it will, uh, the, there will be a kill switch function, right? It can be activated in the event of a scam, right? So you just call in, you press a eight, and when you activate it, right, all, right, the, it enables customers to immediately freeze all their current and savings account, ATM access, debit and credit cards, and even digital banking. Everything will be freeze, so nobody can touch your accounts at all. Right, and this is also embedded in our ATM services as well. So this is also part of our how how do we improve right our security to help protect our customers, uh, to help protect our customers' welfare and being. Wenxian, yeah, I think uh, similar to OCBC and many other banks, I think um, across the financial industry landscape, we really have to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, like, um, you know, data-driven capabilities for us to also detect scam. It's really, really complex. You know, sometimes the customer could be making many small transactions and then all of a sudden, perhaps like there is a need, maybe, uh, you know, they want to send, genuinely want to send money overseas for an investment. Then how do we detect, is that a scam? So from a customer's perspective, that's a genuine transaction. But from actually our fraud detection, it could be a scam. It's not a usual behavior. And then typically, uh, based on our AI, ML, artificial intelligence, machine learning capabilities, our anti-fraud uh, measures, data-driven measures, we might actually uh, suspend that transaction for the time being. And then what our uh, employees, our staff on this, like, you know, on our surveillance team would do would be to contact the customer 
to ascertain is this actually a genuine transaction or you know, to probe further and see whether the customer has been scammed. I would say this is for the good of the customer, but sometimes the customer also looks at it as it's an inconvenience because you know, the transaction hasn't gone through. We won't release the transaction until we're able to speak to the customer. Uh, so we do have these uh, detection measures in place. Uh, similarly, if let's say a customer has already been scammed, because sometimes these are not large transactions, they could also be smaller transactions. After the customer has uh, come to an awareness that actually they've fallen prey to scam, they could also then call our contact center. Uh, we do have like, a, um, they don't have to get cute. So there's a, when they call the contact center, there is like a button on our system where they can press to immediately speak to someone on our fraud team. Uh, similarly, if they go to the branch to request for help, there is also no need for them to queue. They just need to tell our branch service staff that they have fallen for a scam and they need swift, uh, they need help to swiftly intervene. Yeah, I think I think they are all um, very useful. Uh, there was one basic question about actually, can banks ensure that you know? Uh, consumers know how to recognize the right links to click uh, to avoid being led to, into fake websites. But I guess that's part of the digital workshops as well that you conduct. Yes, and maybe I'll just uh, talk about this because um, what MAS has done is in a way they have intervened, right? So uh, at the start of this year, after on the back of um, really the OCBC um, scam incidents, right? They mandate, and also the rise in scams. Uh, that people are falling for. Uh, so there are a whole range of scams. So there are like job scams, there are, you know, like your MOH scams, uh, Chinese government official uh, scams, all these things. It's a whole range. They're not necessarily always banking scams, but because these involve financial transactions, it flows through the banks. Uh, but let's say specifically for the ones where it is uh, phishing sites, you know, fake bank sites, uh, what MAS has mandated the banks is that um, at the start of this year, earlier this year, the banks can no longer send out clickable links in their SMS communications or in their, e their you know, like their mass email communications to their customers. So if you are receiving a clickable link, like a URL link in your SMS, in your WhatsApp, in your email from a bank, you know, these are likely uh, to high, very strong, 100% in a way. Uh, these are phishing links. Do not click on it. Okay. So, but if you are in doubt, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, call our call centers to seek more clarification. Um, but the first thing is because MES has already mandated it, so we know we are not able, to, we are not allowed to send. So hence, if you're receiving a URL, a clickable link, then uh, most likely to be a fraud, uh, a scamster reaching out to you. Yeah, I think Wazir has covered everything, right? Just don't click on, banks will never send any SMS with any phishing links and any links at all. So. If you, have, if you receive anything that um, you thought is from the bank with a link, um, just don't click and share your personal credentials. That will be the safest. Always go on to uh, the bank's app to do your transaction. That will be the safest. If in doubt, call the contact center, press 9 or OCBC, that will be straight away. You don't have to wait. And you, that will be the customer service uh, personnel to attend to, to your queries. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, now I also know I don't click on any of these uh, links. Um, I guess then a particular group that uh, might fall prey um, uh, as well would be maybe the elderly with onset or living with dementia. Um, so, you know, are there certain things that um, the banks, you know, I understand that, you know, at DBS and QSB, you're already uh, doing uh, dementia awareness training for your staff and all, and as well as the customers. Um, but what else maybe are the banks doing today uh, to assist clients uh, with such needs yeah, in their banking and transaction needs? 
maybe I, I, I go first. Yeah. Um, at the bank level, I, um, our frontline staff uh, at the branches are currently, uh, we have an operational guide um, to our staff on how to identify, facilitate and help clients who are managing dementia, right? And the staff are trained, right, to observe certain reflex um, that the customer may exhibit when they visit our branches. So such reflex include being unable to understand or are aware of recent completed transactions. Uh, some may also give very implausible explanations about or appear confused. And when you ask them, they appear confused on about what they are doing with the money. So then we will um, we will bring them to a room, right? We will start to uh, cool them down first, chill them down first, and then connect interview with customers to better appreciate of their mental state upon observing one of the red flags. Right? So um, definitely we are committed in supporting our customers uh, through this stage of their life. Yeah, so, so it's really on a day-to-day -day, uh, with the staff are being trained, um, observing red flags, right? And then uh, how do we how do we ensure right, and help customers through this? And some of the customers, we, we can recognize them in branch because that's when they start coming back already, right? So, and for some of the customers, we, when we rec those that we recognize, we even contact their family members every time customers came. So, so that's, that's the way how, how, we, how we help our community. Yeah, yeah I think uh, very, very similar to what Bob has said, but uh, I also just wanted to uh, use this opportunity to also say that actually, if you have a family member who is... Uh, um, starting to show signs of dementia. Now, it doesn't mean just because you have dementia, you cannot continue to do your banking. But there are different stages of dementia. So if you, so I think there are first, uh, first thing is a journey, right? So if you're already starting to um, so prepare for dementia, I think sometimes we should all, we shouldn't uh, hope for the best and not plan for the worst. I think we should hope for the best and be very prudent and plan for the worst. So I think sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, so I don't want to repeat what Bob has said because it's the same for us, but I think what I just want to encourage everyone to do is to think about uh, lasting power of attorney. I think that's very important. Um, typically, sometimes, you know, there are different stages of dementia. Dementia can also accelerate very fast. Uh, but uh, if you have to, if you don't have a... Um, lasting power of attorney in place, then your family member will have to go for a court order, which can be a much more timely, time-consuming process, um, could also uh, be a more expensive process as well. So I think the first thing is to prepare for dementia. Um, just don't take it for granted that you won't have it. Um, then the second thing is um, actually for family members, if you, so if, uh, at, for DBS POSB, if you um, if you know that your family member also has dementia, actually you can go to the branch and have the family member tagged, so that when the family member and the family member can still continue to uh, perform their banking services, but actually then at least we are aware that they have dementia as well, um, and that we will still continue to engage them. You know. Um, for the type of transactions that they typically perform. And when actually it goes beyond the usual nature of their transactions, then we would also know who is the next of kin that we should contact as well. So these are some of the additional things uh, that uh, you know, members of the public can do and which that uh, at DBS QFC that we also support. So that helps, I guess, the the customers with severe dementia and yes. you know, they are no longer maybe able to access their account in a, maybe in a manner that requires logical thinking. They are very outsized transactions. I mean, I'll give you an example. I've got an elderly uh, relative who has dementia, but I think it's so important for them to still go along with their usual activities, like, you know, have access for money, uh, be able to go to like the coffee shop, meet up with like neighbors, friends, but you see, you know, like sometimes it just depends. I mean, and so, you know, they might have their helper with them to accompany them, another relative, or they're still able to still go out and about on their own to do their daily activities. Because staying at home sometimes is not going to help them, right? So, uh, but actually, so it all started, um, you know, like I said, the early signs of dementia, sometimes very hard to detect. 
But actually one of like for this family member of, of mine um, wants to also continue to have like control over cash. Because again, when you are starting to lose your memory, maybe there are things that you want to control. How do you control your own aspects, right? So, uh, but it actually came to the point. So actually what the family members did was they continued to uh, have let uh, this relative have access to their bank account, but made sure that there wasn't too much money in the bank account. Uh, where, you know, and the family member could still remember ATM pin, all these things. So would be able to still have access to cash for daily needs. Uh, but when it got to the stage where, uh, you know, as the dementia progresses, then you also then have to also think about how do you, um, you know, maybe it's not about ATM anymore. Maybe it's just about, you know, giving like a physical cash allowance for someone to spend out of, you know. So again, all this is highly complex. Uh, but what, as a bank, we are quite cognizant about is actually even for, uh, you know, our customers who are encountering dementia, the stages are very different. Um, and sometimes, you know, they still should have access to banking services, depending on the stage that they're at. It's important for them to still go about with their daily activities, their daily routines. Uh, and then, but how do we support them as the stages of dementia become more complex? Thanks. I think that's that's really helpful. And, and I guess then a, a key uh, part of that actually would be the staff, right? The ones who actually are in the front line interacting with all these um, customers. And um, that's why I think the, the AIC dementia awareness course that, you know, you put your staff through, uh, that really helps. And then after that, that initial course, you the staff will actually have to continually be, be trained um, on a regular basis. So they are also updated. How does it work in yeah. both actually DBS and OCBC? Yeah. So I think for our frontliners, because they are practicing their training, so a lot of it is actually also learning on the job. Um, I, I think the key thing is, so for the new staff, they definitely have to go through the training. But uh, for our you know existing staff, I would say they are encountering such customers uh, pretty frequently, because at, especially at branches, not too different from OCBC and other uh, banks across the island, like at POSB, DBS, actually um, about half of our customers are seniors at branches. So, you know, the, the um, that would be, I would say, because dementia can be quite common as well across in Singapore as people age. So the encounters are quite frequent. I think what our staff are uh, with these engagements, you know, I think the key thing here is to practice empathy uh, to practice patient. So a lot of it sometimes is just speaking slowly, speaking clearly, repeating themselves. Um, yeah, these are the things that uh, they practice on a, a on a daily basis. Yeah. Yep, just like what Wesley had mentioned, it's really about practicing daily and doing the job every day on the ground and learning from the experience. And in the branch, um, all, all in all our branches, we have a very experienced customer service manager in the branch as well. So if our digital ambassador met with certain situations that they may not be experienced in order to handle, there will always be a very senior person in the branch to come out to assist customers. That's really great. Um, actually, at this juncture, uh, quite an interesting question about how you envision the future of the bank in uh, 10 years time or even 20 years now that everything has gone digital or digital um and we are also you know getting our seniors to get on board this journey um how how do how do actually both banks see this uh, journey evolving yeah maybe i'll go first um i think it's very important for the branch to continue to be a community space so actually over the last couple starting in 20, um, 20, end of 2020, we launched a new branch format at uh, Takashimaya. It's actually a branch with no counters, but actually it is a configurable branch where uh, we're able to hold seminars in that space. Uh, after that, we, well, we launched it, sorry, we launched it, um, we de started designing the branch in 2019. We didn't anticipate COVID to come about, right? Um, and then actually uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we've also been 
launching these new branch formats as well, transforming our branches to be community spaces, like configurable, so that we can hold seminars, sessions in there, uh, different engagements. We also open up our spaces to um, even community partners like PA to help hold wellness talks there. So to me, um, I think that as people, like Singapore, we're a very small community, relatively small. Uh, the social interactions, the social ties, the connections matter. I think that's what makes us, you know, Singapore, Singaporeans. Um, and so actually what we want to do is to continue to preserve the brunch as also a space for the community to get together. I mean, typically you see that today. Um, you know, in the morning, sometimes when our senior customers come, they come together with their friend. So it's like they already had their, they gone to the coffee shop, they had their morning breakfast, then like the next activity is they come to the brunch together, you know, they'll talk to each other while they're waiting for service, all these things, right? So in a way, that aspect, I think, is, uh, is something that we have actually actively designed for and want to uh, preserve. But what we want to continue to evolve is definitely many of the transactions that we see are uh, being performed today actually can be performed over a machine. So when we design, we use data to help us understand what our customers, what are the, what type of transactions are customers performing? Can it be done over a machine? It's actually faster to do it over a machine. The authentication of the customer is much faster, for instance. So actually for the same type of transaction that can be done over the counter versus over the machine, the turnaround time is faster. I mean, just think about when you go and get cash over the counter. It takes time because someone, you know, like the cashier, uh, the, the staff has to authenticate the customer, has to take the cash out of, uh, uh, you know, we've got a teller unit, it has to count all these things. Then usually sometimes, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of chit chat as well. So the turnaround time compared when it is done at a machine, much, much faster. Um, and, but similarly, we also know that customers want to bank conveniently, um, especially uh, the pandemic has shown that sometimes people still do not want to be out and about when it's very crowded. Uh, anecdotally, for instance, one of my daughter's teachers was sharing, she still does her grocery shopping at 5 a.m. in the morning because it's the least crowded time for her to go to the supermarket. So she's still scared of uh, getting COVID. So again, we also know this. We know from our data that customers also don't want to go, uh, you know, at the ATM when it's crowded or go to the branch when it's crowded. They want to go when there are fewer people around, right, so that they can safeguard their health. Um, so these are the things that we design for. We design for our customers, like emotional needs, their functional needs, their social needs. Um, and we want our branches to be able to uh, evolve and respond to these needs holistically. That's really nice. How about OCBC? Okay, um, for OCBC, we definitely still believe the branch relevancy and the importance of having a branch in Singapore. As just now I mentioned, 90% of our transactions is already being done through digitally. But I still believe that for banking, right, it's really a mixture. How do we have a combination of digital plus a human element in banking, right? And uh, yes, the digital transformation in the country has, uh, have, we, we started to see hey, banks are seems like shrinking branches, right? Um, but we still believe, right, every key residential areas, we must have a big branch there, right, to serve our community. Uh, that is what we believe because branch is really a, a, a place where customers trust. And you know that if you come in down to the branch, right, you do any transactions, you can be assured that everything will be okay, right? And the next 10, 20 years, actually, um, we just launched a new format of branch, right? And... Uh, it started in 2019, uh, like what, when is it? I think same time as DBS started to think of it, right? Um, but we repurpose our branch. We start to ask our branch, or start to ask ourselves, right? In the next 10, 20 years, how will the branch looks like? What do we want from the branch? Actually, what we are losing uh, for branches now today is that how can we get people from all ages to visit the branch? But for, to do that, you must repurpose your branch to go beyond banking. 
right? And uh, we created the first lifestyle branch uh, for OCBC. And it's also the biggest branch in Singapore now, uh, situated at Wisma fourth floor, right? Uh, we just opened it about, um, about a month ago and uh, we have been receiving uh, uh, tremendous uh, positive feedback from, from customers. So that branch itself is a lifestyle branch where you can find different lifestyle elements inside from books to cafe, right? To, uh, of course, we have our basic like wealth advisory as well, right? And uh, a lot more other stuff in the branch, a lot more retail space in the branch where customers can really come down, right? And I think if you go to that branch, you will not realize that hey, this is this a branch? So, and how does this branch support Right, all the uh, all our consumer uh, products and services. Right, how does this lifestyle partners come together to support the bank's consumers' uh, products and services? And then we we let everybody try banking in a very different way, right? And yes, a lot of digital things inside digital payments as a digital application as well. But we also have lifestyle ambassador, right, going around engaging customers in this interesting space. And uh, it's also a space for, for us to gather people where uh, we have done a, a few seminars in the branch already. And every seminar that we conducted in the branch is full house, uh, up to about 60 to 80 people, because we have catered big space for that as well. So if you ask me, this is the type, I think this is um, the way how we want to move forward, the relevancy of the branch, having that trust there for our customers and make the branch a place for all ages to come down, right? And to rediscover the fun of banking, right? And coupled with every individual's lifestyle as well. That's the one that looks like a bit like Kinokuniya on the outside. Exactly. Right? <laughs> smart, it true. looks like Kinokuniya, but it's not Kinokuniya. Yeah, right? yeah. A whole range of books, cafes, right? And retail partners is there as well, right? And a lot of, the, a lot of um, OCBC brands and products are there as well. Yes. <laughs> If you guys haven't been, I encourage you to go, whether it's DBS at Taka once again, or uh, uh, OCBC at Wisma. Um, actually, the follow-up question, will check payments be a thing of the past uh, in the near future, in the future? That was also a question that came up. Yeah. I would say there are certain types of checks that I think will continue to exist. Uh, so definitely, I think with the rollout of uh, pay now, fast, you know, like um, people have been gravitating towards digital payments for the convenience. It's also like easier record keeping, faster. I mean, I think even, uh, you know, like for us to, let's say when we go out with friends, split a meal, you know, sometimes the inconvenience of having to, let's say, go get physical cash, right, is uh, inconvenient. So, or to get the same correct denomination. So, we are seeing more um, uh, digital payments. I think even in you know tuition teachers, piano teachers, uh, all these teachers, uh, uh, enrichment teachers, they are also more open-minded now about taking digital payments. Um, you don't have to write them a check or give them cash at the end of at the start of the month. Um, so we have seen actually a dramatic, significant increase, uh, sorry, decrease in the number of checks being written. However, I think what we're also cognizant about is that for like certain uh, jobs to be done, let's say when someone's buying a property, uh, they still would prefer to uh, use a cashier's order for such transactions. So I do think that, um, like cashier's orders will still continue to have uh, address a need. So that is also a form of check and that will likely uh, continue to stay unless, you know, I, I, I think 10 years from now, we'll still have cashier's orders. I don't think that's going to go away. Yeah, same thing here, even though the usage level is getting lower and lower, but there's a lot, I mean, in terms of corporate customers, right? I think it's still a favorite from uh, their most preferred mode of transactions. Um, not so for consumers, um, personal banking customers is more towards the cashier's order, right? You buy a car, you buy a house, you pay lawyers, it's still the most preferred way of uh, payment. Uh, so if you ask me whether it will be removed, I, I don't know, but currently all I can say is that it's still the most preferred uh, mode of payments for both corporate and consumer customers, yeah. 
Uh, just one last question um, here that I see, and then maybe I'll just get each of you to maybe wrap up. Um, there's a question about, you know, any learning points for organizations that are embarking on their respective journeys of uh, introducing technology or digital services to their clients. Uh, so what are some maybe challenges and takeaways um, maybe that PBS and OCPC could share? I, I think in a simple, I go first, I think in a simple uh, summary here is um, we also try to avoid doing too many things at one go, right? Because uh, we initially, when the COVID comes, everything we want to rush through all the digital, digital platform, digital platform. But we also realize that when you start to rush through a lot of all these digital enablers or digital capabilities, um, yes, the the younger ones, the more savvy, digital savvy one, they may be able to get it. But uh, the elderly customers, well, they will always be left behind. So um, the challenge here is how, how can we find a balance here, right? When we introduce digital functions that can cater to all aspects of uh, all ages of customers. Um, I think in this digital transformation, uh, I always tell my staff, right? And uh, like I said, banking is about human. Right, digital capabilities is the enabler. I always use this. I always use this. So we are Iron Man, a human body inside with all the digital capabilities outside. So, so I think we are. I mean, it's really on how do we help these customers to board on the train, but not to overstaff them with things. I think, uh, and not all transactions can be migrated from the teller counter to 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 the digital channels. So I, I, I think it's, it's really about finding the right balance and covering all aspects of customers. That, that is always our biggest challenge, right? So any things that we want to do, we, we always ask ourselves, okay, you may satisfy certain group of customers, but what about the other group of customers, right? So these are the constant challenge that we, we, face, we face every day like, when we talk about uh, digital enhancements uh, for, for, for our platforms, yeah. Hey, uh, Sufei, actually, I'm going to weave in my reply and also try to answer one of the questions that we haven't answered from Mary Ling. Okay, so um, Mary Ling had a question about like, uh, you know, I think she experienced a scam transaction um, and it, the, she was surprised that the, when the transaction went through, uh, there was no OTP approval requested for it to go through um, and not all transactions require OTP. So how does she protect herself? So again, using Mary's question, it's a very, very good question. I think um, we, the first thing for our learning journey is to listen to customers, to understand what are their needs, whether or not we have the capabilities to address their needs. So using Mary's uh, question, actually, we know that um, we actually have payment controls function in our Digibank app. So like actually Mary can protect herself by also using, if let's say she's a, a DBS customer, which she is, she can go to the Digibank app in the payment controls and set different preferences for her card. So she can actually say that, you know, I, uh, she can block her card for online transactions. And because all this is instant. So when you're not doing an online transaction, you, can, you set it for, does not allow for online transactions. You can also set your card uh, transactions for, let's say you don't want contactless either. So depending on your shopping needs, let's say uh, you're not doing a lot of online shopping all the time, then you just set for no. Then when you are going to do your online transaction, then you change your setting to allow for online transaction. So actually in our learning journeys, and today this is also a learning journey for me as well. So it is listening, becoming aware of what our customers need, but also one of the things about awareness is actually we have built many capabilities, many services, and it's a lot. And sometimes customers are not aware of these capabilities and services that we provide. So, you know, these learning journeys also give us an opportunity to share knowledge, uh, to see where are the gaps. So I think like earlier today, there was also the question about how do we support the visually handicapped? I think we are aware that is an area that we still need to develop. And as we hear more of these voices, then we also know that it's imperative for us to act faster to address these things. Thanks, Thanks Monsieur. Monsieur. Thanks, Monsieur and Bob. Uh, I think that's all the time we have, unless you have 
last one last comment but otherwise i think uh i'll pass it back to lester great thank you very much uh, sufei for the wonderful moderation also big thank you to our speakers uh very step uh well very established bankers here sharing their experiences mr bob Ng from ocbc and ms yo wen from dbs so thank you to the three of you for that very insightful engaging discussion now, so this uh, event is jointly organized by NLB and SUSS. So uh, we'd like to share some of the resources available. Uh, so first, I'd like to invite NLB's associate librarian, Ying Yi, uh, to share with all of you a bit more about some of the resources that will be available to you through the NLB um, you know, app, through the website. Um, so over to you, Ying Yi. Thanks, Lester. I'm Ying Yi, an associate librarian with the senior services team at NLB. I'll be taking you through some resources put together for this year's TOYL celebration. To show you how to access these resources on your own, we've created a one-stop resource page where you can find all the resources in this link. Once you scan the QR code on the screen or use the link in the chat panel, you will see this web page, as you see on the right, that will take you to our different resources. First up, I'd like to share with you the recommended reads for today's keynote. I have three books that would tie in very nicely with what we have discussed. The first one, Dementia Friendly Communities, Why We Need Them and How We Can Create Them. This book offers an overview of dementia-friendly communities across the globe, touching on initiatives such as dementia friends, memory cafes, and creative engagement with the arts through organizations such as Time Slips. With all these community efforts and those by OCBC and DBS that we heard earlier, we can empower our elderly and people with dementia to continue to be active citizens. In talking about community support, we also have Voices in Dementia, Voices in Dementia Care, where we hear from not just experts across Europe and the United States, but also people living with dementia. And we learn from them what are some of the best practices that can be adapted and applied in the home and in the community. Finally, we have Safe and Secure, 10 Essential Steps for Seniors to Protect Against Financial Abuse. As our country ages gracefully, we not only need to protect our seniors' health, but also their finances. In this book, there are 10 specific and practical action steps that can help seniors scam proof their savings during their golden years. Together with the initiatives shared by OCBC and DBS, we can help our seniors safeguard their finances by recognizing the risk and taking precautions. Moving on, the resource page also links you up to Udemy Business, an online learning platform offered free by NLB, where you can learn at your own pace. You can find up to 13,000 courses, not just on business, but also personal development topics such as communication, mind mapping, and even how not to procrastinate. And also, it has knowledge enrichment courses like art history. All you need is a valid My Library username to get started. We have also put together a resource list on self-care, touching on the physical, mental, and emotional aspects. This guide equips us to manage ourselves better when facing challenges in life, especially important for those who are in a caregiving role. So just as a reminder again, you can find all our recommended resources from this link. Besides what I've gone through, this resource page also links to NLB mobile app. If you don't already have it yet, this handy app allows you to borrow library resources and keep tabs of your phone, 
of your library account from the convenience of your mobile phone. You can also use this link to join our mailing list, sign up for events, as well as read the time of your life magazine written by librarians for seniors. And finally, after attending this year's Time of Your Life celebration, if you're curious to know what we did for our past two editions, you can also check them out through this link. Thank you. I hope you have found this sharing useful. And I'll pass the time back to Lester. All right, thank you very much, Yingyi, for the uh, wonderful introduction about some of the resources available. Uh, so just want to elaborate a bit more on uh, what Yingyi talked about. So we do have a mailing list uh, in the link uh, that was dropped. So you can click on it. Uh, so what is this mailing list? So this Time of Your Life program series features informative talks uh, such as this, creative workshops, book clubs, learning communities uh, for those aged above 50 and above. So most importantly, seniors uh, like yourselves, if you are a senior attending, now you can expect to stay relevant with uh, all these programs that we have uh, as part of the Time of Your Life program. So I encourage all of you to click on the link, sign up for the mailing list. All right, so you can be uh, up to date with all the different programs that we have under the Time of Your Life series. All right, so uh, you know, just um, you know, go through the resources available. Now, I also want to touch a, a little bit on the NLB mobile app because uh, you know this is an NLB event, and you know the NLB mobile app is so powerful. I remember a couple of years ago when I first uh, experienced it, uh, how powerful the NLB app is. So, firstly, uh, the NLB app, uh, you can read newspapers, you can read magazines, uh, all absolutely free. All right, so I I I, I fired it up. I don't know if you can see it here. All right, so basically on the top right hand side where you log in so there's e-newspapers and there's um, media newspapers as well so today if you buy Straits Times uh, the physical copy right now if you go to the NLB mobile app you can read the newspaper actually free you don't even have to pay for anything all you have to do is uh, you know like as mentioned by you just have a login to log on into the app now you can also read magazines those are usual paid subscriptions like Bloomberg Newsweek you can read uh, foreign newspapers like New York Times China Daily The Guardian now these are all free inside the NLB mobile app so it's actually very very powerful Right, so I want to encourage all of you to check it out. Now, in terms of borrowing books, uh, you can also borrow ebooks and also audiobooks as well. So, what are audiobooks? You know, you can just listen. If you don't like to read, uh, you just play it, and it will actually um, somebody will read out the book to you. Right. Uh, on top of that, you can save time as well. You can scan if you're in the library. You can scan and borrow the book via the mobile app. Now, also we do have uh, resources available such as uh, learning new skills. Uh, so there are more than thirteen thousand courses on Udemy Business for Library uh, on the mobile app as well. Uh, so I want to encourage you to check out the NLB mobile app. It's actually very, very powerful. And uh, I personally use it quite a bit to read all these magazines because, you know, I, I have a diverse, uh, you know, interest. So I, I can just go, you know, you can read um, nature magazines. You can read business magazines, finance magazines, photography magazines. Now, these are all absolutely free within the app itself. So I want to encourage all of you to check it out, all right, if you haven't already done so. All right, so with that, um, you know, there's a short introduction about NLB. Now, this event today is a joint collaboration between NLB and SUSS. Uh, so I want to share a bit more about some of the SUSS programs available. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, after attending today, you know, we, we covered on some of the topics. Uh, you know, a lot of you are actually interested in finding out as well, uh, you know, about some of the topics available, especially in regards to aging issues. Uh, today, we covered banking for the evolving community. Uh, but you'll be happy to know that SUSS now is the first university in Singapore to offer holistic training in gerontology and topic aging studies. So SUSS offers programs from minor in applied aging studies for undergraduates and professionals to graduate certificate, diploma, master's and even PhD options as well as you can see on the screen in front of you. So you can be learning about health and well-being, you can be learning about the aging process, dementia as we touched on earlier in the panel, uh, social policies in gerontology, technologies in aging as well. Uh, so you know, uh, you know, also covered by our speaker, Singapore is uh, aging rapidly, right? So to address the Singapore's aging issues, we do need a multidisciplinary team to work together. So you can be one of those to join us to manage the aging challenges together. And also, most importantly, uh, to promote healthy aging together. So if you're interested in SUSS uh, says gerontology programs, now do take a screenshot of this slide that you see here on the screen in front of you. Uh, and uh, you can find out about the next intake and also application details as well. All right, so uh, please feel free to take a screenshot and then take a photo. And then you can check it out. Uh, of course, uh, the SUSS staff will be happy to answer any questions that you have. 